Angel is brought to you by NetSuite from Oracle. The only system you need to run your business. Go to netsuite.com slash angel to get your free guide called Crushing the Five Barriers to Growth. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Angel, the podcast. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis, and this is the podcast where we talk to investors, early stage investors. Now, some of them are running incubators like my guest today. Others are angel investors. Some have small angel funds, and some are even venture capitalists, but they all operate in what's called, what we would call early stage investing, which means day zero to day 1,000. First three years of a company as far as I'm concerned, is the early stage. Now, what do I do? As an angel investor, I invest in 30, 40 companies a year, and I do it with a fund and with jasonssyndicate.com, which if you're an accredited investor, you can go there and sign up, and you can see the angel investments I'm making and uh, potentially join us as we invest in companies. It's a lot of fun. Read the book, angelthebook.com. It's a book I wrote about my experience investing in 150 companies, the lessons I learned, hitting six unicorns in 125 investments. Now, my guest today is Pete Flint, and he not only is an investor now with NFX uh, and running an incubator that has just great buzz, and it's relatively new, but I met him when he was uh, the CEO of Trulia, a unicorn. I believe you hit unicorn mm -hmm. status, did you? Oh, at least, yeah. Yeah, uh, which was sold to Zillow. Tremendous. Mm -hmm. Did Trulia go public and then got bought by Zillow? Yeah. So we, uh, so we went public in 2012 and yeah. then acquired or merged, stock for stock merger with Zillow in uh, 2015 for three and a half billion. Amazing. So Congratulations. Yeah. And we met because we were both Sequoia CEOs. We met exactly. at some dinner sometime yeah. Yeah. long ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but I want to go a little further back. Normally on this program, we get right into angel investing, but I want to just get a little history from you because you also wor worked on a Web 1.0 company, mm -hmm. which I was in love with when I was a journalist in the okay. 90s called... Lastminute.com. Correct. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, you weren't the founder of Last Minute. You joined the management team. What, what was your role at Lastminute.com? So, so yeah, Lastminute.com, a fascinating web 1.0 company. Explain the so, concept of this business and why it was such a juggernaut and so inspiring to people in the early days. Yeah, so, uh, so Lastminute.com started in 1998, 20 years ago this year in... Uh, in London. Yep. And the and the basic idea, which was like the empowering nature of the internet, was taking this unused inventory, whether that's flights, hotels, theater tickets, restaurant bookings, that was essentially unsold at the last minute, putting that onto the internet, some opaque pricing, but certainly discounted pricing, mm. enabling people to take advantage of these last minute breaks, last minute hotels, last minute flights. And it was... Um, you know, an iconic internet company at the time. So we went, so I joined, so I used to work with Brent at a previous- uh, He was the founder? Company. He was the founder, Brent Holman, Brent and Martha founder. Wait, wait, so, you worked at an internet company before that in 1998. What was that company? So it was a small internet company. It was uh, essentially a JV between um, British Telecom and News Corp. Or News oh, wow. International. So it's basically the access of, trying to be the AOL of Europe. Wow. So it was basically the connectivity of British Telecom. And this is what, 95, 95 so 96? 97. So it's like wow. I graduated in 97. It was my first job. Incredible. And, well, so actually, you're right there at the dial-up stage of the internet. Yeah, pretty much. So absolutely. No, this is definitely. So I've my, and, and then the internet company before that in 96 was a company called Delphi Creative, which was like this huh. tiny internet studio. So literally this was like yeah. my, um, so my foray into the internet was I was, I took a, job while I was at university at JP Morgan because I was like, huh. I was like, do I want to Where's become- Oxford or something? Yeah, Oxford, yeah. So yeah, I like, can guess. So you they, know how I knew that? Your no. accent. Ah, and you're successful. Okay, well- Is that the number one school in uh, uh, the UK? I, Oxford? I mean, Oxford and Cambridge are perceived to which be- Which one's better, in your opinion? Oxford, definitely. Of course. Of course. No, which one's harder to get into? Um, Would it be like Harvard versus Stanford? Would that be a fair comparison? Uh, Cambridge versus I Oxford? Think, I, well, I think they're a little bit like- I mean, it's like different things for different, you know, ah. different subjects. So like Oxford's good at other, some things huh. and, um, and ah. Imperial's very good for software, and computer science. But the, um, you know, anyway, for me, it was like, I went to get into the internet. Yeah. Um, and uh, I wrote to every internet company in 96, of which there were 32. <laughs> um, and 32 so, companies. And, and one gave me a job with Delphi. That kind of became line one. And then anyway, I met Brent at line one. And yeah. then, um, and then when he started last minute in '98, yeah, I joined him as first employee. It was such a team. great concept. I just loved it. Like it was predating Groupon, which uh, was like uh -huh. group buying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was it became a phenomenon in Europe because 
I think young people would on a Thursday or Friday be like, let's go to Ibiza. Let's go to yeah. Berlin for a hundred dollars, for fifty dollars, for twenty five dollars a night, whatever. It, it was, a, I mean, literally a phenomenon. So we, so we started in ninety eight, went public in March, March the twelfth, two thousand, and mm. you will remember that was the yeah. peak of the Nasdaq. So we raised yeah. like two hundred million, like. And literally two revenue. months later, the NASDAQ went from 5,000 to 1,500. Oh, and it was like, I mean, literally the price of the peak, so it went down immediately. But it wow. was like, I was in charge of growth. It wasn't called growth then, but it was like, that was my job. Yeah. And it was just a remarkable experience in terms of how to build an internet company. Mm -hmm. We did so many things right, so many things wrong. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, as I think about kind of folks that I looked about now, it's like, is people have been in that kind of like, um, early hyper growth experience, not yeah. necessarily the founder, but kind of seen that experience was yeah. just like super, super valuable for me. So the company would raise a bunch of money in 2000, navigated the dot-com collapse. And mm. then as a travel company that had the, the, the travel collapse that came after September yeah. 11th, they acquired a bunch of businesses. Mm. I left in 2003 yep. I had to move to the U S and then the company was acquired in 2005 for over a billion dollars. Um, wow. Uh, by Travelocity, say yeah. So that travel amazing. space. So you went from the travel space into real estate, mm -hmm. and Trulia was the business model. I mean, it was the most beautiful app in the real real estate space. I always told you that. I thought you made mm -hmm. the most beautiful one, mm -hmm. and you were really early on the mobile tip. So mm -hmm. I think you beat everybody to mobile. Yeah, and it was a lead gen business. That was the primary mm -hmm. kind of use yeah, case. Yeah. So you printed money every time somebody went to look at a house. You got twenty five or fifty bucks from a broker who wanted the lead. That was the kind main of, business model? I mean, the, so, the, so the original concept was that, uh, so I didn't know anything about real estate, but I moved to the Bay Area in 2003 and soon after trying to find somewhere to live. And you... and You, you get a quick education. <laughs> you get a quick education. The, the only way to access information is via speaking to a real estate agent. And we all know we love to be kind of empowered and in the driver's seat. And like, yeah. I said, where is the app to like, to help you yeah. kind of find this information? So the, the original premise was, how do we have the most comprehensive information about real estate combined mm. with the most beautiful user experience yeah. to help people And navigate. it was, yeah. Still is probably. And then we'd monetize through like all, we could see all this like print advertising, which like billions in uh, newspaper yeah. classifieds, that's clearly going to follow the audience. So that, I mean, it was kind of a simple kind of business idea back then, but that timing Perfect. was kind of impeccable. That was, that was yeah. the sort of like... Um, uh, the good 40 plus a whole bunch of execution and growth and product innovation as investors we like to ask the question why now you've mm -hmm. learned this now because you're investing what was the why now for Trulia when you look back on it what was the why now yeah. why did that business work at that moment in time so so two things principally so one was the availability of structured data or search capability ah. so we so we conceived of the business um, just around the time when Google was going public. Right. And it was just like Google was this phenomenal ability to kind of aggregate and, and find unstructured data and essentially structure it. Mm. And so we built a, a, a vertical search engine essentially yeah. for real estate. Um, and so that enabled, and plus the data fees were coming out. So there was this availability of structured data. The other piece was the, you know, post.com collapse, the massive availability of broadband. Right. And so like and pictures, so, pictures and maps. Right. And so like and so we so we were it's remarkable to think, but we were pretty much the first real estate listing site with maps nationwide, which Amazing. was like kind of like and, and we turned a 1D experience into 2D yeah. and enabled people to navigate this. And so that and that was like. This is an amazing experience that you could like previously stuff you'd you'd go through newspapers or you go through um Yeah, clipping uh, stuff clippings and making and your and own like, like spreadsheet of like where these locations were and Yeah, so that suddenly you had this breakthrough cons yeah. consumer experience, both in user experience as well as in content. So that you know, we started off it's a marketplace business. So we started off on the consumer side as well as aggregating all this content. And so yeah. the the time but the timing thing is interesting because it's we started in that time, so we, we launched at the perfect time. But then as you as you know, it's like we launched at the peak of the housing market. So right. in the in the two thousand five, two thousand six period, the house prices peaked, sales transaction peaked, and we were kind of since that point the the transaction slid down. Yeah. So and then obviously in two thousand eight the the um, housing collapse which was precipitated by yeah. the, finan the financial collapse was precipitated by the housing collapse, yep. everything changed. When you go through your second crash, 
what did you know from the first crash that informed how you should run truly? In other words, you watched last minute raise money right before, and if they hadn't raised that money, they would have been out of business for sure. Yeah. And then you watch them weather the storm, get through it and get to a billion. So you must have said, hey, I'm a pilot, mm-hmm. uh, founders are pilots, who went through the turbulence, the, yeah. the worst you could go through, lightning storm turbulence over the mountains, over the Rockies. What, what did you learn going into that and how did you navigate it? Were you more calm or is it still absolutely terrorizing? Uh, I don't mean to cause any PTSD here, <laughs> by the way. I'm having no, a little it's... bit myself. It looks like you got a little PTSD I there. Mean, we've all been through them. Like, yeah. you know, every business is like has its kind of crisis moment. So I think there's, I mean, we had a culture of frugality from the beginning. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, uh, investing in real estate companies in 2006 was a bit like investing in, you know, taxi or ride sharing companies yeah. in whatever, 2009, 2010. It's like... It was extremely unsexy. So we yeah. didn't we didn't have we'd raised some money, we, but we were incredibly frugal. I think there's sort of like um, you know, firstly you need to think about like what is the long term trajectory of this industry, mm. and you know it was pretty clear back in two thousand and one that like people didn't want to fly near term, yeah. people didn't want to go in hotels near term, right. but ultimately they are absolutely going to fly. They're absolutely going to stay yeah. in hotels. And so how do you how do you take advantage of this this opportunity? Mm. Like, let's not waste this opportunity. So the other piece... So in every crisis, there is, in fact, an opportunity. Oh, the great Churchill quote. quote. It's yeah. like, every, you know, seize the opportunity around around the crisis. So we... so we, But that's hard to do. Because yeah. like, you are like deer in headlights. I don't know whether you went to the Sequoia, like... Oh, yeah, no, that, where that they was... Were, like, they were like rest from, in peace, good times. Buckle down, peace, everybody. It was a frightening time. So it's so one is just having the sort of long term view. Actually, like this is and this is a time to date market share. If you have the ca- capability to do that, the second critical thing is around culture. Mm. And I think that the you know we had built a firm culture, a strong mm. culture prior to that. And I think that's is that trust in each other, mm. it's trust in the kind of the leadership, trust in the model, the collective teamwork to kind of to navigate this stuff and and, yeah. and do it together was that, that, you know, there's no way you can kind of get through this stuff without like that culture and that team yeah. to, to do that. And those, and those things, we'd kind of built that foundation from the beginning. There's, you know, there's a million kind of tactical things, but like, you know, being thoughtful about timing, aggressive around market share, because we yeah. knew that like, you know, knowledge I was telling the troops back in 2008, 2009 was that like, you know, the massive web 1.0 travel companies, Expedia, PricelineBooking.com, you know, were, were built in, in the, the down 2001, 2002, 2003 yeah. timeframe. Everyone else kind of created, but they kind of, their chief scale. So what happened for us was that we, we kind of navigated this, this period and we, you know, we had to pivot business model, a whole bunch of other things, and then came out incredibly strong. Yeah. And both times you weathered an 80% decline in the market, <laughs> which is when you think of it, just unbelievable. But it's it's a, it's it's like, I mean, that's a contrarian view of investing, right? Yeah. Those are the, it's clearly the worst time to, you know, to or perceived to be the worst time to get involved in online real estate companies in 2009 or get in online travel companies in yeah. 2002. But looking back, it was like mm. absolutely the right time. All right, when we get back from this quick break, we'll uh, do a quick segue into your investing career after you've navigated uh, successfully through two amazing exits uh, with Trulia and Last Minute. And we'll talk about why you decided to go into investing and uh, join and or create. You, you created NFX, right? Or they recruited you? A bit of both. A bit of both. When we get back on Angel, the podcast. Okay, everybody, let's talk about something important. The top barriers to your growth, to the growth of your startup. Well, an Inc. 5000 survey tackled this very topic, the top barriers to growth. And here are those top barriers. Number one, it takes finance too long to close the books. We've all been there. Two, the company is too slow to launch new products. We've all been there as well. Three, hiring and keeping good people. We all know that's difficult. And number four, managing cash. Very hard. And number five, Too many disconnected systems. We're all struggling through this. And finally, it's hard to get a full picture of your biz. Yes, that's what Inc. 5000 learned when they did their survey of the top barriers to growth. And because people 
have outgrown their business and financial management systems, they are facing these very six issues. That's why QuickBooks and spreadsheets might be fine to start, but eventually it starts taking two, three, four times as much work to get answers for your business. And those answers aren't always correct. They're outdated, they're incomplete. And you should know that the number one system for growing companies is NetSuite for Oracle. So when you outgrow all this QuickBooks and spreadsheets and disparate systems, and you want to really get your company to the next level, you need NetSuite from Oracle. NetSuite is the one system that tracks and manages revenue, cash flow, HR inventory projects, and even e-commerce for every industry. Now you can run your business from a dashboard on your phone. That's why thousands of companies use NetSuite. It's the only system you need to run your business. So here's your call to action. Go to netsuite.com slash angel, netsuite.com slash angel, and get your free guide. And that guide is called Crushing the Five Barriers to Growth. That's netsuite.com slash angel, netsuite, S-U-I-T-E, dot com slash angel, the only system you're going to need to run your business. Thank you so much to NetSuite from Oracle for partnering with us on Angel Season 2. Thanks again to the team at NetSuite. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Welcome back to Angel the Podcast. You can visit us, angelpodcast.com, or you can search for Angel in your preferred podcasting app, whether that's Spotify, iTunes, or Overcast. And when you type in Angel and you search for it, you will find a bunch of podcasts by religious people who believe that angels are among us. That's not what this podcast is about. This podcast is about angel investing. So you probably want to type Angel Calacanis. Um, but we do get a lot of people, for the people who are listening right now who thought they were going to get a religious podcast, praise Jesus. I'm sending all the angels to you. Um, my guest today is Pete Flint, and he is uh, a serial entrepreneur who is now doing investing. Uh, about, I don't know, a year or two ago, I became aware of NFX. Mm-hmm. Uh, people kept saying NFX Guild. They kept saying there's an incubator or an accelerator or an fund. Clarify for us, what is NFX? Because I know there you have two partners or three partners in this yep. thing. And when I saw you go over there, I had heard the buzz about it, and I didn't know what it was. I didn't recognize the other partners. But I saw you go over there, and I said, hey, this must be legit. Yeah. What is NFX? Why did you join and or found it? Yeah. So... So NFX today, we're a $150 million seed fund. So we just announced our seed fund back a couple of months ago, end of November, early December, which, and our, and our focus is investing in so-called network effect companies. Okay. What does so, that mean? Define network effect companies. So it's essentially a network effect company is one where with each additional user, mm-hmm. it makes the product better for every other user. So Got they're it. sort of classic examples we know are, Obviously, Uber, Airbnb, in my domain, last minute, is essentially a travel marketplace. Yep. Uh, uh, Trulia was essentially a real estate marketplace. We also think about platforms, data network effects, a hmm. whole bunch of different companies that sort of exhibit this, this property from B2B to B2C. So our thesis is to invest in network effect businesses. The, the kind of, the, I'm so fortunate to work with two incredible partners. One is... James Courier. Yep. James is in based in Silicon Valley with me. He's got this amazing background, both an entrepreneur as well as an investor and advisor. So he's founded a number of companies um, that have been very, very successful. Um, he's an advisor and he's sort of a growth whisperer mm. to an amazing number of people, an investor in companies like Lyft and Poshmark and DoorDash huh. and House and, and many others. And then Gigi Levi Weiss um, is based in Israel, but mm. he's back and forth um, a couple of times a quarter. So, so you're actively investing in Israel as well, or mostly we are. US? Absolutely, yeah. But uh, those aren't network effect type companies. They're not known for marketplace. They're known more for enabling tech. Is that right? There's some, yeah, certainly some truth in that. We have a very broad sort of aperture around like mm. how we think about network effects. So, so let's take Waze, for instance. Sure. Waze is Israeli company. Incredible. But there's clearly a data network effect there. The more people use Waze, the better it gets. And yeah. like, you know, every Uber or Lyft driver pretty much uses that. Absolutely. Right I mean, if you, so th- if you think about network effects, one of the amazing things that people, I think, don't actually understand about a network effect is that every time somebody joins, it potentially makes every other person's use of that product considerably better. So the way to think about that is if you and I had a fax machine, we can each fax one person. Yeah. There's two connections, yours to me, mine to yours, but we had a third person. Now both you and I can 
hit that person up, exactly. and the fourth person comes in, oh, my God, all of a sudden, fax machines become valuable. Yeah. Uh, and certainly with Lyft, with the drivers, or Uber with drivers, Airbnb with hosts, you start adding more hosts. Yeah. There's more transactions that can occur. There's more customers. More customers equals more money for those hosts means they invest more money. And ultimately what this provides is defensibility. So we've gone back and looked at all the billion dollar plus companies over the last, since the origins of the internet 20 plus years and seen that 70% of the value that's mm. being created by technology companies ah. comes from companies that have a strong core network effect. So we we know the names, sure. like whether Google. it's Facebook or Google, whether it's ad network, fundamentally, yeah. where they might have. So yeah. like once, and once you're like in and, and start and scale a network effect business, you realize there is no other type of businesses that's as interesting or as valuable as a network effect business. Ultimately, because they create winner take most or winner take all. Yeah, winner take most seems to be what we're seeing these days. Usually there's like a duopoly or three people involved chopping it up. The first one gets 60, 70% like Facebook, Twitter and Snapchat get 10% each or something of social networks well, and we're I, done. I mean, it very much depends on the type of network effect. Yeah. So we've, we defined 13 different types of network oh, really? effect and so, and built playbooks for each of them. So the, I mean, the tighter, the, the, the sort of, the, the more defensible the network effect is, the higher the, uh, the market share. So let's just take ride sharing. So yeah. certainly in, in the Bay Area, it's a duopoly yep. right now. Um, and that's because there's an asymptotic network effect. As long as there's asymptotic. A asymptotic. Asymptoting. Yeah. Um, okay, hold effect. on a second. I don't have a dictionary handy here. Emmy Warbring Jack is going to put that definition. Explain to us what asymptotic means. So asymptoting. Um, asymptoting. As <laughs> I didn't go to for, up here. I didn't go to Oxford. I'll be honest. I, you, know, you got to tell me. Define so, this word. So essentially, what it means is that. Like you, do, you and I don't care as long as the pickup time is three minutes ah, or less. Commoditized, so there's so a commodity type business. Well, there's a necessary scale, ah. but then like, I mean, the definition of a network effect is that as each incremental user makes it better for every other user, that is true up until a point. Right. And that point for most people is three minutes in, in the Wait area. Time. Whereas you think about something like Airbnb, that is a network effect business, but it's actually not, it's, it's really become more, um, in many people's eyes, almost a monopoly for that type of industry. Sure. Um, because of the lack of commoditization uh, uh. of that product and the multi tenant lack of multi tenanting yeah. often on the supply side. So you, so we're like, you know we're incredibly deep in these type of network effect business, both as operators and as mm. and investors. And so, you know, our our view is that we think that this is the most interesting type of company to mm. invest in, and we're kind of you know, multi-category, multi-industry. What um, about Amazon? This is one of the biggest companies, mm -hmm. but they have a small percentage of overall commerce, a decent percentage of online commerce, but yeah. they certainly haven't been winner take all, but they've become huge. Is that a network effect business in your mind? I think it's, so it's interesting. The shopping side of it, put aside Amazon Web Services, but the shopping, yeah. you and I buying. So stuff. Amazon absolutely didn't start as a network effect business. Right. It started as, this, you know, its defensibility was principally through brand as a, a mm -hmm. first mover advantage, through scale, through the distribution piece. Mm. But what they added on, you know, during the kind of the, you know, several years after they launched was the marketplace and network effect mm. side of their business. And you think of, you know, everything from the data network effects, from the recommendation engine and the reviews down to the... Um, down to the marketplace, you know, where they've with third parties can third sell, right? Party yeah. selling, and so they've they've the initial entry point was was not a network effect business, and now they're scaled around yeah. absolutely a network effect business, and sure. their defensibilities are monstrous now, from scale yeah. to brand to embedding in yeah. all these systems, and then obviously network effect, which we think is yeah. the most interesting because it's it's frankly the cheapest to to get going. I wonder how you think about the data thesis of investing, like whoever has the most data, because network effect is something we've all been sort of mm -hmm. watching over the last couple of years. Okay, we get it. Net marketplaces, network effects is a good place to, to fish for startups and to build great businesses. But now we're having a whole group of people who are saying, you know what, it's the data. And in Amazon's case, they can study the data of what's being sold and say, you know what, yeah. <clears throat> we should make a camera bag. And so my camera bag's an Amazon camera bag, yeah. Amazon basics. Yeah. And They've gone to, I think, something like 1,500 SKUs that are Amazon basics now from mm -hmm. just like 100, like the cable. So mm -hmm. what do you think of data businesses like Facebook, putting aside their network effect, yeah. being 
potentially another thesis for investing. So Do you a, look at that lens of yes, the power of data? For sure. So we, we, so we look deeply at data network effects. And so data we, network effects, I like yeah, combining both. Exactly. So there's so data network effects. So we, and I think there's like, I mean, lots said about the incumbency advantage around data network effects mm. and AI businesses. So like, so how is it possible that you can ever build a next generation kind of, let's say travel company because right. all Expedia and Booker.com have all this data. And I think the, the kind of interesting thing is like some of the, some of this data is, as used the same language as before, is asymptoting that you yeah. don't, just like in Yelp reviews, like after the 50th review of a restaurant, like I don't need the 51st, I've got no. a sense of it. So, that, so some of this data is asymptoting. The other piece is that the data is often not the right data to solve the problem. So take self-driving cars. It's like, it may be awesome that Tesla has all this data, but it doesn't have the LiDAR data around mm. it. So there's the data network effects in self-driving mm. cars in the... The more data you have, the safer it is, the safer it is, the more distribution there is, hence the more data, but are you getting the right kind of data? So um, it's a like, you know, we're, we're pretty sort of um, technical and, and kind of deep yeah. in this network effect. And we think that that's, you know, that, that our job is to spot network effect businesses before there's like a true network mm. um, opportunity and, and also help them to scale that. So uh, why did you decide to stop being an entrepreneur and to start being an investor, I'm curious. People have different reasons to do this. You're rich. You got a lot of money, man. You took two cook a company public. You don't need any more money, right? Like, why do this? So, uh, I mean, you know this. Like, you've you've kind of been you've been starting companies, you've been investing in companies. This is the greatest thrill you could possibly have while working. It's unfrigging believable. So yeah. I so I, you know, I came out of ten years of Trulia. Um, and, uh, you know, I sort of forced or maybe my wife forced me to take a year off and like, okay, let's just like calm down. And what was that year not... like for you? Well, I had my second kid then. So, uh, so I was changing diapers and like, lovely, um, but what I, you know, what it happened was I, I dropped my daughter for school and then, and then, um, meet with entrepreneurs, huh. you know, literally from kind of 10 to a five. Um, Incredible. and it was, and I, and I was sort of testing out this idea of being an investor. I mm. spent a little bit of time. At a, at a sort of VC back in 2004. Oh, it's like a venture partner or something, like loose affiliation? Yeah, while I was at Stanford Got um, it. at grad school. So I was like, and it was like, it wasn't the right time for me then, but this mm. was just like, you know, the greatest impact you can have. Were you have. part of the Sequoia Scouts program? I was not, no. You were I, not? I kind of already had liquidity when they ah. were like... Um, and you were like, ah, I don't that. need to be part of that. Um, you, but did they ask you? Did you pass? They did ask me, but it wasn't wow. like I already had sort of. So getting a hundred k or fifty k or twenty five k from them to invest wasn't necessary. We were, yeah, we I'd already taken truly a public by that point, so it wasn't like. Um, so when uh, you're meeting with all these founders and they're telling you, "Hey, here's how I'm going to change the world," and so, you, so, but it, so so what I found, so I started angel investing, and it's yeah. and it's like it's incredible, and it's like you know a number of very successful angel investments as well as. Mm. Um, you know, incredible fun dealing with entrepreneurs, yeah. but I actually found it quite unsatis unsatisfactory in that it's a, you know, I've, I've found professionally that um, working with teams of smart people mm. in solving massive problems is the most rewarding thing. And for me, teaming up with James and Giggy is just sort of incredibly valuable. It amplifies my good ideas. Yeah, It's sort of like, it changes and and sort of like uh, evolves my bad ideas, mm. and it's like, it's just more fun working right. with um with other great people. So yeah. that was my kind of I wanted to be part of a team sport as mm. opposed to an individual. So Angel yeah. was good. It was a way to kind of test my learning on my own money, but I wanted to you know what we think about what we're building right now is really much more of an institution. Mm. Like we're trying okay, how can we turn a kind of interest and experience in in investing into a much bigger platform. Yeah, you know what, speaking of platforms, I, I logged into something at NFX, it, it mm -hmm. went into my Gmail and figured out who I knew and how many jumps I was from everybody. Yep. And I was like, oh my God, I don't know if I wanna do this because it's gonna result in my email box getting a lot of uh, emails, but I'm in the business of getting emails. So what is this product that you created? Yeah. Cause I don't know if it's for me as in, you know, super router angel or if it's for new investors or it's for founders. What is this product called? And is it just a little experiment? Yeah. So we launched a service. You're referring to Signal. Signal. So signal.nfx.com. So this is, a, this is a product we've been working on for last year or so, which is essentially 
solving the problem that you know very, very well, which is the warm introduction problem, which yeah. is like you probably, like me, get, get thousands of emails yeah. a yeah. year from entrepreneurs who are looking to get capital. Yeah. And having a warm introduction is the best way as a filter to say, well, that's kind of interesting. Okay. If this person thinks it's interesting, that's a great filter. Mm. Um, and we were finding, and we built this product initially for ourselves. So with the problem, what we found was that kind of we were spent literally hours every day making warm introductions. So we built a software tool to, wow. to, to solve that yeah. problem. Um, so what it does is essentially like um, entrepreneurs and investors log in with their Gmail. It figures out kind of who they know and the strength of that connection, not just like... Yeah, how many um, emails have we gone back and forth? Yeah, we don't read the emails. We don't know kind of what they're talking about. Yeah. We just like, and in the database, it figures out the sort of strength of connections between people mm. to, to solve the problem. Like, oh, if you want to speak to Rolaf at Sequoia, well, is it like Pete or is it Jason who's right. the best person to make that introduction? Right. Was he um, on your board? He was not on my board. Right, so he's on he was my board, on, yeah, exactly. so there you go. But I, but I know him, but yeah. you, you probably have a tight relationship with him. So Perhaps, yeah. Um, so that it figures out kind of who makes a warm instruction. So it's a software problem, mm. a software tool that's solving this problem for entrepreneurs. Got so it's it. good for investors, it's good for entrepreneurs. And this is like, I mean, so why are we doing this? Like yeah. Why are we kind of, why are we investors building software? Building software? So yeah. one is like, we built it for ourselves, but it's a network effect business. It's sure. network effect product. So the more people that use it, the better it gets. So we open it up to mm. everyone to get them to use it. Yeah. Two is that we are a collaborative investor. Mm. So we're like, we, you know, we're a seed stage investor. As you know, seed rounds are typically collaborative. Oof, you bring in people. other people and it's like, and so we wanted a tool that we could like figure out, okay, we can work with other people sure. to, to navigate this. Three is like, you know, in our heart with software entrepreneurs, yeah. we like building Yeah, products. you look at the like, world through a software lens. Exactly. And we yeah. see a problem and, and this is more broadly, we look at venture capital. We think this is like, kind of an antiquated industry in the same way that yeah. software is transforming everything else you know we think that ultimately software will transform venture yeah. in a in a kind of meaningful way it's not it's not necessarily to replace um you know the general partner although that who knows that may yeah. happen at some point well it might replace 20 percent of or augment 20 percent. so you're really making partners bionic when you well, think about it it's sort of like a cyborg kind of thing that's exactly how we think about it yeah. like how can we and it's also like and we, and we think about we think about different levels. So we think about one is like we want to build software to help us become bionic and help us mm. to be more successful. Two is we want to build software to help our portfolio companies to be better at what they do. Yeah. You know, there's, and that's beyond just a simple form. And three is like, unfortunately, we can only touch like 90. So we can only touch one percent of the people that we want to work with. So how do we build software to help, help everyone? It's interesting. We all come to it with what we know. You're a soft, you know, as software people, you build software. And me as yeah. a media person, I built a podcast yeah, and yeah. Write, write a book and have it's an event, right? Valuable. Like it's like yeah. all of these things are potential ways to solve some of the same problems yeah. uh, and getting to know people. What's the average check size that NFX likes to write? Is there an average so, check size? Yeah. So we invest, um, I guess, the sort of typical we've done, we've been up and running for almost six months. So we've done about... Um, eight transactions right now. They're all stealth. We haven't kind of announced oh, anything okay. right now, but like... You've done eight investments? Yeah. It's fascinating. As a, as a I didn't fund. get one email from you about any of these. Well, don't you want to have the world's greatest angel investor in any of these deals? <laughs> I keep saying that. Someday it's going to be true. <laughs> uh, but so, well, what's the story here? How come I haven't got any emails yet? So, uh, so You took uh, the whole round? No, we didn't take the whole round, but like we don't, we don't you know, you only reached out when, when yes. the podcast, so we need no, to, we like, need to we uh, spend more time together. Exactly. Well, this is the thing that uh, we've angel investing really is about is oh, understanding amazing, each yeah. other and what how you invest it's one of the reasons i started this podcast is we understand what we're looking for and what target zones yeah so what is a chip table check size Can you have so 150 the, so million off on so 500 to a million so the majority of deals we've done is one to two million bucks oh okay so this so is a serious we, check right yeah and so our own issue, so we typically is one to two million bucks um, which has been the majority of the deals that we've done. We've done, so ownership is sort of 10 to 15%. Right, because you're investing in companies with six to $12 million valuations, I would guess, 15 that million. Kind of, that kind of neighborhood, yeah. Um, so these so are- bigger uh, seed rounds, typically. Yeah. So we, I mean, we, we span from kind of pre-seed to A, but like mm. vast majority of stuff we've done is at the seed stage. And interestingly, um, the seed stuff would have been the Series A when you and I were coming up. Oh yeah, for sure. $3 million round, yeah. that was a Series A. Ten years ago, yeah, uh, yeah, the truly a Series A was two point four million uh, on a ten million post. 
Yeah, not even that. But nine it's million like, posts. Oh yeah, around that figure. Yeah, yeah it would yeah, be yeah. like it would yeah, have yeah. been like yeah. for twenty percent of the company or thirty exactly. percent of the company. Yeah. Now, truly, would have gotten what? Uh, I don't for know. For twenty like percent, what's a ninety ninety million series? <laughs> <A>? <laughs> it was one of those, wasn't Aurora, it? Yeah, the Aurora. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. So. um uh, I don't know, but you like, take a board seat because that's a pretty significant. If you own 10, 15 percent, do you think there should be boards? Do you are you pricing the rounds? Two questions. So we so we certainly are pricing the rounds in the majority of cases, but not why all cases. Uh, are you pricing the rounds? Explain to people why you think this is a good practice. Well, I think it's so you what you see is that the overhang of the debt when mm. companies are raising kind of multiple debt rounds, the overhang and complexity of that mm. is is bad from a dilution perspective from the entrepreneur, but creates a sort of ambiguity and mm. lack of um, willingness to step up mm. from an investor to say, we're committed to this company. And so we're, you know, we've done a lot of, you know, as a group, we've done 300 investments. So we like, we have pretty high conviction when mm. we when we want to invest. And so that means like, let's lead the round, let's price the round, let's make it. So you of, lead and price and you yep. say, hey, listen, we'll yep. do this, but we want it to be a priced round. Yep, yep. And do entrepreneurs fight you on that or no? They're just like, we're just happy to get no, you I on the team. No, I think they're like, I mean, there's a sense of like, they, they, I think pretty uniquely because the operational experience we kind of bring, they mm. kind of like, okay, we want, we want NFX on board yeah. to help us to scale this business. And then we don't, we don't, um, we act like board members and we set up board meetings and we are kind of in incredibly engaged in the company. Yeah. We don't typically take board seats at the initial investment. Got it. Although as we kind of like either sort of scale our ownership and get to know each other, then we would we would head down that yeah. path. We like we sort of think board board participation is a two way street as well. Yeah. If like if we're adding value and they're adding, you know, they're finding that, you know, that, that the relationship is going well, then it will head in that natural direction. Yeah. I and mean, you have a bunch of people who are unwilling to take board seats or unwilling to price these rounds. So I feel like it's creating a bit of chaos. I think that's, I mean, that was our observation. So we so, I had a similar one. It's just so, chaos out there. Yeah. But there needs to be someone to step up and say, like, okay, this is, we're going to get behind this company. We're going to yeah. speak to the entrepreneur. We speak to the entrepreneurs typically weekly where we, Incredible. Uh, where we're spending an hour, certainly the beginning of the relationship, an hour with the entrepreneur talking through everything. We help them set up board meetings. We give them kind of access to our broader community of founders to help to share different information, mm. whole bunch of different content, which um, helps them to kind of ultimately have a fast start when they're, when mm. they're getting going. There's a, you know, there's a bunch of, we think there's a bunch of content out there, which is available, but you know, we, we talked about the sort of, you know, NFX guild, the guild piece of NFX, essentially this community of founders mm which help each other. So like, yeah. so when you and I first met at yeah. Sequoia dinner was essentially like a private group yep. of portfolio companies that is sharing the secret kind of tactics. Yeah. And you and I were like talking SEO and mobile. Yeah, and what about this new stuff. iPhone? So this, so the really yeah. cool stuff, the is app like, store came out is the really cool stuff is not published. No, it is shared between portfolio companies. Yeah. And so we try and facilitate that. In it a will very, be published typically way. 18 months after it's, Important. Exactly. Yeah. So it's always trailing. By the time somebody writes yeah. it as a medium post, that's like the 18th person to use the technique, which yeah. means the technique's probably been burned out by mm -hmm. then if you're it's, getting it at that point. Exactly. So it's like the bleeding edge stuff happens founder to founder. So I we agree. try and facilitate that. What qualities do you personally, leave, leaving aside your partners, but just you look for in a founder? What do you think is important? So, so three things. So one is persistence. Mm. You know, this is a, like, you know, Trulia took a decade um, from founding to exit. Yeah. Um, persistence. And we love to back kind of founders that become, you know, that will be the CEO of the company mm. through kind of being, you know, beginning. How do you know to, if to the exit. founder is persistent when there's only six months or 18 months of data? Is it just a sense you get from talking to them that they're never going to give up? I think, so it certainly is trying to look back in their past. What are the mm. kind of like, how have they approached things? Mm. What are the adversities they face? How how are they? How driven are they? Yeah, truly driven, right? To to change the world, and you know, and it's also about making sure that there's a passion to the problem that ah. we're trying to solve. So, so driven and passion, yeah. But there's just you know persistence, and that can show up whether that's like they're a chess champion or they're an athlete or they're like mm. they've done something remarkable that gives them the persistence to yeah. go, or they've 
you know, recorded 800 blog posts. Like there's, there's a, like a, yeah. a, or a podcast. There's yeah. like, um, um, so it's certainly that persistence. Next, there's this, um, what is this unique insight huh. around the market or unique technology capability, unique founder fit. There's often, you know, to get certainly in network effect businesses, there's like, mm. how do you solve one side of the, mm. the chicken and egg problem? How do you kind of like, how do you get this thing going? How do you turn like, you know, fuel into fire? Right. Um, and, and, and what is that insight, that capability? Mm. Um, that so that could be an idea. Test. It could be an insight. It could just be some strength they have. Like they just exactly. know how to onboard drivers or yeah. get, you know, it, it seems to me like the Airbnb people just really knew how to like build a listing page. Mm -hmm. Like they knew to go take the photos, even though they didn't have photographers. Like, you know, we need better photos. Let's go yeah. take some photos. And the sense that this is a, you know, design led. Yeah. Um, and PR, you know, they were able to kind of the insight around that and scrappiness. And then the third piece is like, is not just good at building product, but good at building company. Mm. And, you know, there are so many founders that kind of like, you know, hit a wall at a certain point, whether yeah. they like, you know, then they're not, they don't want to scale or they can't scale and just a thoughtfulness around company building. Yeah. Because it's like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how good your product is. If you, if you're not able to build an amazing company around that, yeah. then you're ultimately not going to be successful. So Reed Hastings comes to mind, like it, they got the product right, but he just also seemed to be obsessed with the product that is Netflix. Yeah. Yeah. Who do you look at that you say, wow, that person is just obsessed with the product that is their company. You have a good example of that where you go, wow, this person really works on the features inside the company. Tony Shea from um, Zappos comes to mind too. He was a real culture obsessed person. Yeah, I think, you know, I, you know, the, you know, one of the most exceptional kind of like uh, CEOs is obviously Jeff Wiener from LinkedIn. Mm, yes. And, that, and I, and I, you know, I don't know the kind of inner workings, but my, my sense is that the kind of, you know, Reed is obviously a legendary product strategist yes. and, and, the genius behind LinkedIn, you know, recreated the product. Yeah. But Jeff created the company. That's right. And it's like, and the the work that Jeff did behind the scenes um, um, to kind of evolve that into what it is today is is um, is kind of remarkable. Like in our, you know, the, in in kind of the you know some of my angel investments that I've made. So there's former. Truly employees like Sammy, hmm. who co-founded True with me, he's building an amazing culture within Verta Health, which is uh. di you know diabetes. Um, oh, company. really? That's that one of NFX's or yours? That's one of my angel investments. And how and is so, he taking on diabetes? Is he doing it with software? Is he doing it with hardware? So it's primarily software, ah. um, but it's a just the clinical trials around that and diet ah. and training and nutrition is such is a hard remarkable. space. I just had a company called Open Listings on. Uh, which is yeah. trying to do like um, the Redfin approach to real estate, yeah. you know, giving back some of the commission. Uh, and I was just thinking, God, people who go into healthcare, real estate, construction, or education, music, like these categories are, they need technology so bad, but they just fight against it. Is it advisable to go into those categories or do you look at them and say insurmountable? Obviously for real estate, you didn't, but... Education, construction, music, you think like, ugh, too hard? I mean, there, certainly there are categories which are super hard. So yeah. clearly like, you know, music and travel oh. are kind of like ones which are kind of pretty saturated at various different points or have sort of challenges from the industry structure. Um, I mean, I think what like the high level view is, I, I use this phrase called the technology tsunami. Huh. So you, this sort of notion that you kind of see this like, unstoppable wave of technology mm. coming in and it's like it's picked up the low-lying areas yeah. so like it's picked up media yeah you know communication yeah. you know travel is being sort of transformed and it's moving yeah into higher ground into yeah. higher ground right. relentlessly yeah and so it is inevitable that it's now kind of transforming transportation obviously. yeah that was a hard one i remember introducing uber to people and they're 19 out of 20 one or 22 people, I think it was three people said yes, me, Cyan, and first yeah. round. And so everybody else was like, you want to, one person said, you want to be in that dirty business with those people? And I was like, kind of a little racist, but okay, what do you mean by those people? Like cab drivers, mm -hmm. like these are just unintelligent foreigners. I just, it's going to be, your life is going to be dealing with cab drivers. And I was like, okay, that's slightly racist or kind of yeah. racist, but 
I understand you, you don't want to be in a business where there's a car accident. That was kind of their point. They're like, yeah. it's, I would, why don't we just make software is what they said. Why don't we just make software for cab companies? But I think you, so you start, so clearly it's like massively changed in the last like, yeah. six, seven years. So it's like, and then obviously in kind of real estate, um, which is a regulated industry, kind yeah. of a bunch of kind of uh, fintech and regulation changes. But it's like you've seen companies like WeWork. Right. Or, you know, Zillow Group's now a $10 billion company. Incredible. And Airbnb is like it's changing the nature of space. Yeah, hospitality, real estate, they, they're starting Health, to flip. Healthcare is oh, like... Oh, that's going to be is, the big is one. inevitable. And then, you know, in multiple different ways. So not just in terms yeah. of like building apps to help you kind of track your steps. Yeah. But it's... it's that know, would be the low-hanging fruit. It's like, yeah, just yeah. $99 Fitbit. But yeah. it's, you know, we've invested in synthetic biology and CRISPR companies. Oh. And so which... What are they it, doing? What well, category? It's, so, it's in, so, it's, so it's in CRISPR specifically. Yeah. So it's like, so it's interesting how you see these chemistry becomes digital. Yeah. And as we think about it at, at NFX, how you see these, um, you know, the techniques that are applied in the software era, which is principally network effects. Yeah. Um, are going to be applied also into the into the biology arena. So like Crazy. genetics and synthetic biology. and yeah. We're all um, going to have CRISPR. the same dog our whole lives. <laughs> like Barbara Streisand. This should be like, oh, before your dog dies, make another one. Yeah, and agriculture. I'm an angel investor in Plenty, mm. which raised hundreds of millions from SoftBank. And yeah. it's, um, you know, vertical farming and, and agriculture huh. is another incredible... Um, so somewhere in a city, there'll be a eventually a 50 story building like something out of Gattaca or some crazy sci-fi movie with vertical farms well there's uh, plenty is like it's exactly what they're doing yeah. which is like turning and they have I forget the number but it's like 100 to 1 in terms of space efficiency wow. and, and what they're in terms of the acreage exactly because you've got vertical acreage yeah and it's like it's a software company that happens to be in like um, have they built units yeah yeah they built what's the tallest unit how many floors uh, I don't know Floors exactly, might be but the it's, it's not, it's, you know, there's a sort of mid-size, but it's, um, I mean, it's just, it's just the whole thing is that you're starting to use these software techniques, whether that's kind mm. of machine learning, yeah. uh, whether it's computer vision, whether that's kind of automated process start to change all these different elements of our society. Here's what I think is going to happen. All these garages, you know, being a real estate person yeah. yourself, the, they would force people to make a certain number of parking spots, like one mm -hmm. to one or one per bedroom is crazy. Yep. And so when we get to self-driving and car ownership in cities is like, you're going to be penalized for it big time. Like if you want to put a car in a city already in London, the congestion yep. tax, you get charged, what, 20 pounds to go into the city during mm, something crazy. Like that, might yeah. be 50 pounds. I don't know. It's absurd. Like yeah. only these jerk off bankers do it uh, in London. And we need that here in Soma. So all these internet people with their cars don't drive into like second and market. It's mm -hmm. crazy. But we could reclaim these huge sure. garages in the it's center of New York, in yeah. the center of Paris, in the center of San Francisco, and make them into farms or convert them into apartments. Yeah, yeah. We desperately need housing. It's it's uh it's inevitable. I think yeah. I mean like I am I have this, you know, some people have this sort of dystopian future the of the dystopian view of the future, but yeah. it's, I'm incredibly optimistic about our cities because you can start to see, like we were just talking about, yeah. you know, I bike around the city these days. and Yeah, like, the jump and bikes in San Francisco took over in a month. I know, it's amazing. And Two so dollars like, a ride. And so you can imagine, a, you know, a world where there's like, there's no sort of crazy drivers in the city. They're yeah. all kind of like pretty safe, tame computers that are driving around and like, and you get the sides of these streets are going to disappear, which are currently yeah. where parked cars are. I think it's it's a remarkable. This is a and we're big, all going to live to two hundred as well. So I know Peter's great. working on it. We'll get our, We need yeah. to get a blood boy. Maybe we could split a blood boy because I can't afford a full blood boy, but we could split one. That would be a great time sharing a blood yeah, you're boy on for, your own there, for people who don't know. <laughs> there was this rumor that Peter was having transfusions, and then on Silicon Valley they called it a blood boy, where the guy who's kind of the yeah. CEO of. Google, which they call Hooli on the Silicon Valley show, was getting transfusions from like a young athletic boy. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems like logical that we will, I mean, we've already extended life far beyond what we're, our genetics are supposed to do. They're going to figure this out. Unfortunately, yeah. I think we're going to miss it. I think we're going to get, what do you think? We get 10 extra years on average or I, our kids I, get 20? We I, get five, I, our I kids think, get 10? I think it will. I mean, there's a sort of, I forget the term, but there's a kind of a point at which life expectancy increases faster than aging. Right. Which, and it becomes a singularity uh, sense. And that's I, not us. I, I actually think it might be. Really? I think, I mean, you know. We're in our 40s. 
Yeah. Mid, and so, late 40s. You're 45? 40, thank you. 43. Okay. Um, I'm 47. So, like, uh, so I, I actually think it will happen. I think, you know, we the nature of, to. I mean, just this notion of kind of like, you know, exponential thinking in the yeah. sense that you you under you kind of like overestimate in the kind of near term, but underestimate right. in the midterm. I this and all this stuff is turning from chemical to digital. Yeah. The, explain to start, people what the CRISPR is for people who don't know, because this is kind of mind blowing for people. Just can you explain it <laughs> in a like, on the spot? Okay. Well, I mean, the the CRISPR allows you to modify the yeah. So the CRISPR genetic, is a protein, yeah, essentially, and then there's. Um, various different Cas, Cas9, oh. Cas13, which enable you to reprogram right. um, genetic material. Incredible. Uh, which is like, and it's a science which is like, you know, been around the last couple of years. It's quite contentious because mm. a whole kind of pattern fight between yeah. kind of Berkeley and I think the Broad Institute. And it's, um, uh, but essentially the sort of, the, the capabilities around that on the kind of near term allow you to, you know, perception to kind of change genetic makeup of materials, which is like transformational. Um, and so it could... Everybody's going to have beautiful blue eyes like us, Pete. <laughs> Nobody's going to have brown or black eyes anymore. I mean, it's literally what it's going to be able to do at some point, right? People should be able to do... Well, uh, there's a lot of sort of ethical kind of um, stuff that will need to be figured out. But it's mm. like, I mean, you know, the amount of sort of genetic diseases and, and other things that could impact is like... Yeah, no, can you imagine if you have, like, I have a family member with cystic fibrosis, which is just, you know, really Mm -hmm. serious, Mm -hmm. serious disease, impacts a small number of people in a very big way, and most people don't live past 20, sadly. Like, we, the same way some plagues and diseases we were able to eradicate, we might be able to eradicate genetic diseases or postpone them. I mean, if you think back to, like, you know, in the, you know, people created sort of genetic variations by treating them to kind of a, you know, radiation roses and like yeah. all those variation was kind of hit by sort of different chemicals and different um different radiation and created sort of different varieties that way like it's incredibly sort of cruel and primitive to do yeah. it that way and this technology enables to do that in a whole range of different agriculture mm. and obviously human biology and uh areas which is uh, which is kind of, which is completely remarkable it was pretty crazy. I went to Monsanto at one point. They had a couple of entrepreneurs and investors out. And I was like, yeah, you know, most hated company in the world doing some of the most interesting things in the world. I got to check this out for myself. Mm-hmm. And it was quite interesting because they're like, well, here's what we're doing. We're making wheat with thicker husks. I'm like, why are you making thicker husks? Well, because you have these bugs that can eat the husk and then they wipe out the crop. So we just make a thicker yeah. crust and a shorter stalk. And now we've genetically, you know, and it's like, that doesn't seem so bad to me. Like, is GMO bad necessarily mm. or is it good? I mean, people have a very, I think a lot of these like lefty organic people mm. are just immediately dismissing the concept of using science. But we were using science for hundreds of years to cross beat animals and, you know, make certain dog types and, you know, make certain plant types by, you know, fertilizing tall ones. Yeah. Yeah. But I think what we're seeing is that this is a, like a change in Silicon Valley right now. Oh, for but sure. Like, so I think you look back over like 20, 30 years ago, and a lot of the, you know, you go back to the kind of like Google days of like two Stanford PhDs with a patented algorithm yeah. was the hottest thing in Silicon Valley. Right. And then you go into like 2008, 2009, like post the sort of the smartphone yeah. launch, like two kind of design students with a really cool app. Right. And it would like explain Change the world. And now it's going back to that kind of like, you know, it's engineers. Like, it's engineer driven and yeah. it's hard tech. It's it's and it's engineers not only are kind of building sort of very unique IP, but it's also surrounding themselves with thoughtful people to navigate whether it's regulated industries, yeah. um, whether it's tough go to market problems, um, whether it's tough scaling, mm-hmm. manufacturing things they're trying to figure out. And it's a it's a sort of weird time, as you know, the, the kind of like the the sort of ocean front for for investing is extremely wide with all these different kind of incredible different kind of industries that is, that is impacting. Yeah. And the science behind it is um, is incredibly deep. And yeah, we see in The New York Times story like Silicon Valley's over. Everybody's leaving. And that with the exception of the real estate problem, I don't know if you saw the story in The New York yeah, Times, yeah. but they're like, oh, my God, Peter Thiel's leaving. This person's leaving. It's over. And I just thought about it. I was like. 
feels like we're in the second inning or third inning to me. It does not feel like it's over. I mean, certainly San Francisco as a city is completely mismanaged and absolutely yeah. a disaster. And the Bay Area's real estate situation, as you know, being the CEO and founder of Truly, like that's a disaster as well. But the creativity and the boldness of ideas here, I don't know if it's ever been at such a high level. Yeah, I don't think it's certainly not over. I think that, you know, sort of, you know, we're obviously students of network effects. The network effect of Silicon Valley with this combination of capital, culture, mm. and talent mm. is um, uh, is breathtaking. And it is like, unbelievable. And it's like, you know, while kind of there may be ideas and there may be scaling that happens outside of Silicon Valley, this is the best place in the world, certainly mm. in the Western world, to start to build a world-changing company. How do you think about valuation at the early stage? Do you look at deals and go, eh, you're asking for 15 million, it's really an $8 million company, or do you subscribe to the, listen, if it's a great company, six, eight, 15, it doesn't matter. Because it's a question I get a lot by new angel investors. Yeah. How do I know if the valuation is too high? Well, we, we force ourselves to be very, or we, we sort of, by our nature, pretty disciplined on valuations. Mm -hmm. I think we, we found that it's, um, you know, Obviously, there's like a, a, bar, a group of companies that have massively inflated valuations at the early stage, which creates downstream problems for them. What are those downstream problems? If you have too high a valuation in the early stage, why would it create a problem in the later stage? So, I mean, the big challenge is in terms of attracting further later stage ah. investors. So clearly, if you're raising kind of like six million at a kind of like um, uh, 20 million post as a seed round, unless you're able to make enough traction to raise the A mm. um, at a kind of a high valuation, you're going to, you're going to face problems. So it's, right. so it's clearly they are, um, you know, we, we subscribe very much to kind of a sense of small amounts of capital, early, modest valuations yeah. to help to scale the company. Right. Six uh, to 10 million, that range seems normal in seed. Yeah. In terms of seed. I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, Every company is different. There's sure. some companies that require a little bit more capital to prove to create yeah. proof points to get to the A. Yeah, um, I'm in that situation with Cafe X right now, which is it's a hardware-driven company, right? And real estate, you know, there's like there are a couple yeah. of factors here that you have to put a little more money in. Yeah, but I think it's it's. Um, I mean, there's a. It's often quite easy to attract um, small angel investments via a note, mm. um, and you can you know raise with sort of credible entrepreneurs raise substantial amounts of money but then there's like no one really wants to step up to the a yeah pretty because they they haven't seen enough kind of traction yeah and they have too many choices right like the series a people seem to be looking at 25 companies in the last month that have a million to two million dollars in arr yeah how do they pick yeah. they don't they just yeah. wait to see which one hits four yeah that's it's, a big problem isn't it yeah, yeah it's it's a you know part of our observation around raising the fund mm. has been that you know, there is this sort of spectrum of choices between, you know, whether it's the kind of like big seeds, small seeds, pre-seeds, A is like, there's a, in this area, there's clearly a kind of gap. There's both yeah. a gap of kind of willing people to, people willing to step up mm. and to invest and to, and to support them, as well as a, um, uh, a kind of a range of different choices where we can yeah. invest. It's definitely, I think, the opportunity for folks like us to do these I do 250 to a million dollar checks. You do one to two, but it just seems like everybody left this space. Everybody's like, yeah, I'll just go later and put more money to work, raise a bigger fund, get bigger yeah. fees. And it's like, that's not what these young promising companies need. So I think they're missing. I think it's our opportunity because they're missing the chance to own 10% or 15% yeah. of a company for a very small dollar amount when they're nascent. Well, I think it's, I mean, there's, <clears throat> there's both the, for us, it's both the sort of, you know, we think this is the, um, the gap in the market and, and the opportunity. But it's also like, you know, we've been in companies of very different stages. This is the most interesting time in a company. Mm. The product market fit stage yeah. is the most interesting time. I in love the that stage too. Why is it so fascinating to you? It's I mean, it's clearly the most formative time. Yeah. It's like you've got this kind of founder product fit combined with this product market fit. Yeah. And it is a you know, it is when you start to see it, it happening, it's mm. like lightning in a bottle. And it's so like great. incredibly um, nuanced and challenging to necessarily find that. And it's, and it's, and you see just like, I'm, I'm, there's a, there's a founder I'm invested in. Um, 
and he's texting me kind of like every three hours because there's some insight that he's had and we, we spend we it's speak like zeus much throwing daily. a lightning bolt down it's like yeah by the way the gods have just said yes and he's been working and he'd be working on this stuff for kind of months and months and yeah. months and months and like in the last week he's had three sort of transactions and it's just this like you can see that this is like um the energy and the kind yeah. of momentum is like he's got it so he's in this groove and he's yeah. like okay now i can like execute and, this that, was amazing. and that's so formative it is. And it was amazing to see with the jump bikes, mm -hmm. which we were all sitting there for years watching electric bicycles in China. Also, Norway and Germany started to get the yeah. bug to a certain extent for these bicycles and electric bicycles. You saw it in Denmark. And I was just sitting there going, I wonder if Americans are going to go for this because they don't ride scooters. But in Europe, everybody's on a scooter, you know, like an electric scooter. Yeah. Or, I'm sorry, a motor scooter like a, a Vespa. You go to China, you see like a hundred Vespas at a red light. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. And and then 200 bikes behind them. And I was just wondering, when is this ever going to happen? And Scoot Networks here with the Vespas yeah. didn't really break out. It did okay. Yeah. But now for some reason, these bicycles, electric bicycles seem to be winning the day. Yeah. When you look at that, what, what do you think the difference is? Why does one catch on and one doesn't? Is there some science there that you've, or some insight you have as to when this lightning in a bottle happens? So I think, so typically we, we see it happening in the combination of three things. So one is technological, ah. two is cultural, um, and the other is economic. So like, so technology, so let's take these jump bikes. It's like, you know, it's a combination of essentially mobile app, electric, um, uh, and electric, enabling them to kind of provide yeah. this sort of mobility solution. It's really the battery. Yeah, the battery is yeah. kind of like as in the. Yeah, if it wasn't for if it wasn't for phones, the batteries and Teslas and bikes yeah. wouldn't be so, so, this, so dense this and amazing. Technology breakthrough, yeah. kind yeah. of both on the consumer battery and the kind of e-bike. Yeah. Then there's cultural. I think there's like you know there's a sense that actually like you know cycling is like, hey, it's a pretty damn efficient way to get yeah. around, and like it's sort of good for the environment and it's pretty good for your health. Yeah. Um, so it feels good culturally. And then the third is kind of economic in the sense that there is like, you know, certainly I kind of bike around the city in the sense that there is, it's, it's cheaper than kind of like yeah. stuck in traffic. And mm. it's like, saves me, it's about the same time. So you've got, so I look for these like technology catalysts, societal yeah. catalysts and economic catalysts. And when you get all three of them, yeah, wow. like, I mean, like take Airbnb, this is like, you know, technology economics certainly kind sure. of coming out of the kind of yeah i can rent a two bedroom for 209 instead of staying in a hotel with a one bed for 309 yeah people one wanna, bedroom people want to save money yeah. as well as they want to make money yeah. out of there and that's that sort of catalyst yeah plus there's Magic. a sense of trust of like the internet is like okay More well, i don't know who this stranger is but there's enough kind of like that's the innovation that I think most people see. I think you hit it, Pete. Most people can't put their finger on that one because it doesn't exist as GPS or batteries. What that one is, is reputation systems. Yeah. So because everybody understood the Yelp reputation system or the Facebook one or follower accounts, whatever, uh, or TripAdvisor, whatever, now they say, oh, well, if there's a rating system in reviews, mm -hmm. which is a technological innovation and a cultural one, you know, if 18 people have stayed here and given it five stars and the one yeah. person who complained, the host replied and explained, hey, listen, you know, here, here's what happened. Yeah. The, the heater broke. It was my fault. We gave them a credit. They're still angry. Like, people understand that. Yeah. And the that cultural breakthrough yeah. is like, you know, you see like old school investors like, well, that's never going to work. But then you speak to kind of like millennial um, yeah. users and like... You know, obviously, sure, I trust that way more than some sort of yeah. They're like travel listen, guide on the in the kind of bookshop. It's exactly right. Else. They're like, why would I trust some hotel yeah. for my safety? I mean, I would much rather trust this person who owns the home who's letting me sleep on their guest house. These, it's much safer than a hotel. And this, and you know, these when you think about these catalysts, certainly cultural and technological, they're moving so fast right now. Mm, and yeah. so that you know, clearly that creates the opportunity. You feel old so now, other. like where your thoughts. Uh, as a Generation X person like myself, that our thoughts get in the way of our ability to invest in this new crop of ideas. Do you feel that sometimes? You have an example where you said, like, I, I would never do this. I would never Snapchat myself all day long and make 50 videos. But I understand that millennials grew up with cameras and phones and they have a different idea about socialization. So they would make 50 yeah. videos a day. I'm not a narcissist maniac. I'm not going to do that. Do you find yourself hitting those moments? Um, you know, I, I certainly did. Like, I, you know, I was like, like laser focused on like of running a public company yeah 
And like you, you have a set, you, you become conditioned mm. in that environment to actually like, okay, I know this kind of vertical extremely well, and this is the business model, and I like, yeah. and I cannot deviate from this. And so, uh, and then over the, I think I've kind of re- had to reprogram my brain yes. from kind of being this sort of like deep kind of industry, sort of an operational expert into this broad kind of cultural and technology expert and covering all these things. And you end up kind of being a lot more sort of um, prepared and open-minded yeah. around stuff in a way that you kind of perhaps perhaps wouldn't be. And I think you are, you become, I used to be more dismissive of this yes. sort of, like, of these things than I am today because you, real, you realize that, it's, you know, it's not about kind of necessarily what you would do as an no. individual, but you actually like, if this was to happen, then I can believe. Right that that will be a very big, a yeah. very big thing. I tell people you have to unlearn what you have learned. Yeah. You must unlearn what you've learned because yeah. it may not apply anymore. And just because you wouldn't stay in an Airbnb and you wouldn't rent out your guest house as a 50-year-old or a 40-year-old, that does not mean that a 20-year-old who could never afford to go to Japan or Paris is not going to take the opportunity to go there for the first time and stay there for 10 days for the price yeah. it would have cost to go to Florida. They want to be more adventurous and it's an easy, like if, uh, yeah, I'll stay on somebody's couch for 50, 60 bucks or in their guest bedroom yeah. rather than not go to Paris. Yeah, it's an I'd, easy decision for a young person to make, but you would never see that. I would never see that because we like, why would you try to save a hundred dollars and stay on a serial killer's bed Yeah, in their house, right? <laughs> like it makes no sense to us. Yeah, no, I think it's, um, so that I've, you know, there's, and there's, it's changing different, inf- particularly kind of financial services, healthcare, yeah kind of, you know, real estate industries where you kind of have these preconceived notions around, yeah. okay, of course you need a mortgage to do that. It's like, yeah. Well, maybe you don't. Or of course I need to have health insurance or maybe yeah. n- reallocate that. But so then uh, I will take it that you're buying every ICO you can because you don't want to be uh, so close-minded and stuck in your ways that you're buying tokens and Chuck E. Cheese tokens instead of equity. These eight deals you've done are all ICOs or... Uh, we've, <laughs> we've invested in some crypto stuff. Um, An ICO or equity in the uh, company? These ones, it's a sort of mixture. So it's... Um, we, I mean, we don't sort of have any... I mean, the good thing about a new fund is yeah. that we're kind of like pretty... We, we saw the ICO thing coming. And we were able to structure ourselves. What did you think of that ICO stuff? When you see these tokens and people raising $10 million with no product. Yeah. I mean, clearly there is like this sort of, um, there is some concern around it, but I, and there is a huge amount of very, very, um, I just like low quality. These are, these are opportunistic entrepreneurs who are trying to kind of, you know, raise money from people because they can, not because those people should invest. So there's a lot of, I mean, Concerns. It's, a, it's a wild west and a lot of cowboys out there. So, yeah. but that said, there are a few highly legitimate um, and very credible um, ICOs out there that yeah. we think, are, we, which we think are kind of interesting. So, Do you think you could actually stomach buying tokens and not equity as an investor? Yeah, yeah. You could. Yeah, yeah. I can't stomach it. It's not preferred, it yet. but it's, it's like, you know, I think it's... Um, I would need to see the token in use yeah. For six months or a year before I would ever want to buy tokens with no protective provisions, no equity. It makes no sense to me that a large venture, ca- I heard there's rumors that large venture capital firms were buying the Telegram mm-hmm. ICO. And I was yeah. like, how can you take a retirement or an endowment's money and buy tokens that are not even being used in the world and not own equity, have no protective provisions? It, to me, seems very troubling. Well, here we are. This is your old school kind of point of view on these things, which is like, and I think there is, I mean, I, I do believe that the blockchain and cryptocurrencies have the potential to dramatically change our financial yeah. systems. And it's like, you know, I, I was speaking at Stanford the other day and like asking them what the kind of, what the, you know, what the students are kind of into. And unsurprisingly, crypto, blockchain, in the same way that you and I grew up and like- The know, internet. The internet, and we could like program HTML. Like, um, it was just like and people told us internet would never be anything. Yeah, it was native to kind of us. And I think yeah. the native language, certainly in the computer science department, yeah. is around blockchain. The only difference was, I think, in that era, we knew what we were using. Like you said, we could code HTML pages. We were using mm-hmm. HTML editors. 
And I see these people doing crypto and they don't understand the underlying asset, what they're buying, who they're buying it from. Well, that's the investor club. The, the yeah. investors are like looking at that. But I think the, you know, the wave of talent coming in is, is, it is remarkable. Yeah. It is absolutely remarkable. And what, what's happening right now is that the, the kind of the value of the aggregate value of some of the projects is kind of up here in terms of financial value. Yeah. But the kind of like economic value creation is down here. Yeah, 1%. And we've seen this before, right? Yeah. In the internet. And like, and so the same thing kind of happened, but it's like... It's got to flip. Well, it's... It, we. It, so one of two things will happen. Like either the value is created or catch up yeah. to, the, um, to the economic value in the ecosystem or the prices will come down. Prices I, have come down 50%, 90%. 90% in ICOs, 50% in crypto. So yeah, maybe we're in, maybe we're soaking in it right now. But I think, you know, long term, we're... You know, I'm a I'm a big believer, and I think it's and it will mm. come in a sort of perhaps the less obvious way, is a little bit yeah. like it did in the the internet. Yeah, um, like who would have guessed Amazon would have been the winner? It's like the guy selling books, that's the winner. That's the guy who built the cloud computing infrastructure. Well, see the well, I don't know. You, you, you know, like who looking, saw that coming? Certainly, the cloud infrastructure you couldn't see that coming. No, um, but certainly the kind of biggest retailer, maybe you could. It was maybe. like maybe. Um, it was a little um, like he's really going to compete with Walmart. It was like, yeah, shipping's too expensive. Yeah, but it's time and time again. Yeah. The incumbents basically, um, mm. uh, you know, get overturned by the the um, yeah. the emergent. I think it's what is sort of what is sort of interesting is also around the globalization of this. Like, mm. you know, we spend like we, we kind of like the nature of our partnership. We have one Brit, one Israeli. And mm. one American, and so we're like ah. naturally kind of like tuned to kind of to take the best of Silicon Valley, but also kind of expose ourselves to global thinking. And it's um, we think often a lot of the most interesting innovations that are happening in the in the blockchain are happening outside the U.S. And mm. it's going to be fascinating what happens in regulation yeah. in the SEC with relators. Does this kind of create a fertile environment? Right. For this, innovation is clearly a massive opportunity of innovation. Yeah. This or does is, it diminish it and, it's, yeah. and it spreads into other parts of the world? This to me seems like the, this is the real conundrum we're in. There's obviously these ICOs or the majority of them are incompetent and or frauds just by the fact that one study said 60% of them have gone dark in only right. 12 months. Yeah. Like w funded startups don't go dark in 12 months. Mm -hmm. It may take them two or three years to go dark, but 60% don't go dark in the first year. So there is a yeah. massive amount of fraud and an even larger amount of incompetence. I think everybody who, even people who are the biggest crypto heads agree in the ICO space. So clearly there's fraud and the SEC needs to protect people. But there's clearly a massive opportunity for distributed systems to have a financial incentive like this is incredible. Absolutely incredible. So if we enforce the rules, we drive them to places that are unregulated. Those unregulated people, whether it's yeah. Puerto Rico, is now going to have a crypto. Brock Pierce is building some uh, crypto yeah. nirvana. And then I think Taiwan is building one. There's Zug in Switzerland. Yeah. And, they're all, and Peter Thiel is going to build an island. And there's going to be all these places <laughs> where we can go and not pay taxes or not check if somebody's an accredited investor. Yeah, I mean, I think for really to create economic value, it has to be sort of supported by, um, you know, governments in, in kind of meaningful ways. Otherwise, mm. it's just not, there's not going to be enough economic value or become right. the kind of like, it, it won't be adopted, it won't be, you know, part of the um, mm. currency or infrastructure. But it's a, um, I think it's, it's, it's basically, it's out. Now. Yeah. It's a little bit like, you know, it is, the you know the the genie's out of the bottle so For to sure. speak the technology cannot be disinvented no and so it can be about, regulated it can be regulated and it can be kind of um, illegal it can be made well, well know, china I don't know will if that's and a solution to it it's, it's not like, a solution but it is what people in china do i mean they ban vpns and they ban twitter and facebook so mm -hmm. it can happen it certainly can happen but i think it's i, I i'm very bullish on it as a kind yeah. of as a technology and infrastructure it's like it's going to be the wild west for a little bit God. certainly a few more years but it's you're starting to see highly credible entrepreneurs yes highly technical um founders yep get involved executives are kind of like in this ecosystem and you're yeah. starting to see what silicon valley does best which is the kind of innovation plus yeah. the execution come in to build these 
ultimately world-changing organizations. All right, let's recap. It's been 75 minutes with Pete Flint from NFX Guild. And by the way, if you didn't know, that stands for Network Effects. You can visit them at nfx.com, a three-letter domain name. Wow, you guys definitely, that's not cheap. Early. You got early. NFX.com. And what did we learn today? They write one to $2 million checks, uh, reasonable valuations. They like to price the rounds. They look for founders who are resilient and uh, won't give up, indefatigable. And uh, believes in crypto Mm -hmm. and survived two unbelievable crashes and built during the down market. I think that's such an important part because the market, we're in the second largest, longest bull market, I think, since World War II. It's going to happen. It's going to be great for entrepreneurs. Fantastic for entrepreneurs. Then there won't be as many companies. Yeah. And getting a meeting with guys like us won't be as hard. Mm -hmm. And gals, like it's going to be easier to get meetings, easier to get capital. The valuations go down, but the opportunity will go up. Absolutely. Build in a down market. Yeah, yeah. All my great investments. Yeah. Down market. Yeah. Google, Facebook, Uber, built in down markets. The opportunity. Exactly. All right. Thanks for coming on the program, Pete. It's my pleasure. It's been too long. We haven't seen each other in a while. Congrats. And I'll look forward to getting the next eight deals. I'm always looking to get a little piece of that. All right. I need to get a little piece of that cap to save Jake Hall a little slicey poo. All right, everybody. Uh, Thank you, Emmy Award winning producer Jackie. Uh, and, uh, thanks to everybody for supporting season two of angel, the podcast. It really helps if you go to iTunes and write a review because my mom reads everyone. You can then tweet that review to me, take a screenshot, tweet it to me at Jason, and I will retweet you and, uh, give you a thumbs up and a fist bump. Go ahead and write a review on iTunes and follow us, et cetera, yada, yada, angelpodcast.com. And if you haven't read the book already, please go buy the book. It's a great deal, if I do say so. Books are ridiculous. 16 bucks, 10 bucks. You get all this knowledge. Uh, and if you want to angel invest, or at least see what I'm angel investing in, uh, read the book first. Make small bets. That's always the advice I have. Year one, no rush. Make small bets in a lot of companies. Don't spend more than 10% of your chip stack in year one. Learn. Right? You weren't writing million-dollar checks the first year, right? Yeah. 25, 50, 100. k yeah. Scale from there. Scale from there. Take yeah. your time. It's no rush. Learn. We're, this, it's the third. In, as far as I'm concerned, we're in the fourth inning of Silicon Valley. The best is yet to come. I think. I think so. All right. On that note, uh, thank you again, Pete Flint. Follow him, Pete Flint, on Twitter. And if you're doing a network effect driven business, this is the person you want on your team. NFX.com. We'll see you all next time on Angel the Podcast. Bye bye. 